those three chapters uh, over and over again, perhaps from several different translations and have allowed uh, the words, those very important words of Jesus to sink deep into each of our hearts and our minds. Today we want to talk about what matters most, your worship, your worship. Back in 1978, the Chicago Tribune newspaper reported the story of a New Mexico woman who was frying tortillas when she happened to notice that the skillet burns in one of the tortillas resemble the face of Jesus. Her husband and neighbors were called in and they agreed. So she took the tortilla to her priest and had the priest to bless the tortilla, brought the tortilla back home, put it in a glass case, uh, surrounded it with piles of cotton to make it look like it was floating on clouds, built a special altar for it, and opened that little shrine up to visitors. And according to the report, within a few months, more than 8,000 people came to the shrine of the Jesus of the Tortilla. <laughs> All of them agreed that the face in the burn marks on the tortilla was the face of Jesus, except for one reporter who said it looked a lot to him like former heavyweight boxing champion Leon Spinks. <laughs> it seems incredible that so many people would worship a tortilla. But such a distorted concept of worship, friends, is not really unusual in our contemporary society today. Uh, tragically, although the Bible is crystal clear about how and whom and when we are to worship, I would suggest to you this morning that there is little genuine worship according to the Bible that takes place in the American culture today. In fact, the subject of worship, I think, is one of the most misunderstood doctrines in all of the scriptures. And that misunderstanding has devastating consequences. In fact, I would even I'll go out on a limb today and suggest that there may be some of us here today in this room right now who have some misconceptions about worship. In fact, let me just give you one example. If when you hear the word worship, what automatically pops into your mind is what we've done for the past 30 minutes or so, and then your, your thinking ends with that, then you're in that category. Now, is what we've done worship? Absolutely. And very important. And it's, it's very important that we do that on a regular basis. And uh, uh, in fact, we'll read a passage in Revelation a little, in a little bit that will uh, help you see that. But folks, that when we come and the praise team comes up here and leads us as they've done this morning, that is simp should be simply the continuation of our worship. The, the worship that has been going on throughout this past week, throughout this past month, day by day and hour by hour as we've sought to live within the, uh, the confines of the, of the scriptures of how God has taught us to live and how Jesus has taught us to, to think and to talk and, and to act. All of that is a part of our worship. But today we want to talk about what matters most, your worship. And you'll notice on your outline just two major headings. In the first one, we want to talk briefly about the meaning of worship. And, it's, and this is basic to our understanding. This is a foundation if we're going to understand what worship really is, to see the meaning. Now we could do a word study and, and look at some of the Hebrew words and Greek words that are translated worship. But uh, for the sake of time, I'm not going to do that. I just want to point out that the best way to understand the meaning of, wor of the word worship is that worship is tied to the concept of worthiness. The, the concept of worthiness. In other words, we may discover what we worship by asking what it is in our lives to which we ascribe worth. Uh, what, what is that which has great worth in your life? Uh, in fact, look at these pictures on, on the screen. Uh, sort of a, a mixture of, of things up there. But they all have something in common. Look at them for a moment. What do they have in common? The answer is they all represent something to which great worth is ascribed. Uh, let me illustrate by looking at them individually. For example, the Taj Mahal in India was built by Emperor Shah Jahan in memory of his wife, a Muslim Persian princess, who died after giving birth to their 14th child. And, uh, and in fact, the Taj Mahal came about as a result of her request before she died that her husband build a memorial to her. And so 
1631, construction began. 22 years later, with the help of 20,000 workers over those 22 years, the Taj Mahal was completed. And of course, today, millions of people go to see the Taj Mahal. Shelby and I had the opportunity to see it uh, firsthand when we were in India a couple of years ago. But obviously, this emperor ascribed great worth to his wife. And I think we could say he worshipped her uh, because she had such great worth in, in, his, in his sight. Well, Buddha was born in 623 B.C. in Nepal, an average baby. But uh, as he grew and showed signs of wisdom and did some things and spoke some things that people ascribed great worth to, eventually he became recognized as a god. And so today, especially in China and India, Indonesia, all of Southeast uh, Asia, there are over 500 million people who ascribe great worth to Buddha. And so they worship him. Well, the, the cobra, that's an interesting one, isn't it? The cobra is actually worshipped in India as one of many gods. In fact, in India, every year they have one day that is set aside as cobra worship day. And hundreds of people in India die on that day as a result of having been bitten by a cobra that they were attempting to kiss. Can you imagine? And in the process, were bitten and killed by the poisonous venom. I, I can imagine that I might worship a cobra, a dead cobra. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but people worship cobras. They ascribe great worth uh, because that's what they, they've been taught. Now, please don't misunderstand what I'm getting ready to say regarding the next picture. Golf is a good activity. Uh, not wrong in and off itself. Uh, I golf, I play at golf every now and then. Uh, we have some excellent golfers in the congregation here. In fact, we're working on organizing another golf tournament, church-sponsored golf tournament. So you may be asking, so then why do you have it up there with Buddha and the Cobra and the Taj Mahal? Well, for a simple reason. Because of the fact that golf can, notice what I'm saying, golf can have such worth in a person's life that it comes before anything else, even God. And so that person then becomes a worshiper of God. Now, the same could be said of money. Money, as, is there anybody here this morning who doesn't have any money at, at all? See me afterwards because we need to help you out. Okay. We all have money, don't we? Why? It's necessary. Uh, it's a necessity for carrying on life. We need money for food and shelter and clothing, gasoline, lots of money to buy gasoline. Uh, <laughs> but, but Jesus, recognizing that money can become the object of our worth, the object of our adoration or our worship, said very plainly in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew six twenty four. he said, you cannot serve both God and money. Why? Because he recognized that there are a lot of people, and there were in his day and there are today, who to, to them money becomes their God because they want to work and work and work and, and, uh, and uh, get more and more and more, never having enough. And so it becomes the object of their worth. And so as we think about the meaning of worship, it's important to note this principle that everybody worships something. And think about that for a moment. And there, I recognize that there are people who would, who would uh, deny that, that, that thought. They would say, Jimmy, no, 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 that, that's not so. There are people who don't worship anything. I don't think so. Even the atheist worships something, even if it may be that he worships the concept of atheism, or it may be that he worships himself. But everybody worships something. You may worship your work. You may be a workaholic, and, and work is right at the top of the list as far as things of worth in your life. If you be in that case, I suggest you change because that's idolatry. You may worship your family, your spouse, your children, your grandchildren. If they're at the top of the list before God, friends, that's idolatry. You need to change. You may worship self, uh, you know, uh, you're the, when you, as you go through life and all of the decision making that you, uh, that you do, uh, it's always what I want, regardless of how it impacts anybody else. And if you're in that category, again, 
my encouragement is to change because nothing is to come before God. Uh, and so we, hopefully we will obey uh, the words of Jesus when he said in Matthew twenty two thirty seven, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And one other uh, parallel passage says with all your strength as, as well. So God is to be first. And so the meaning of worship is what has worth in, in your life. Now, let me move on to the second point, and let's talk uh, um, to a greater extent about the magnitude of worship. The magnitude of worship. And when I say the magnitude of worship, I'm talking about how important it is. And, and, and we're talking about the worship of God who is to have first place. And, and folks, it is so important. In fact, as I was working on this sermon and, and, and started really thinking about how to develop the magnitude it overwhelmed me so much, I thought there's no way I can deliver this sermon in this message in one sermon. And, and I really am not, but uh, it's just sort of a, we're hitting the, the, the edges of it. But uh, so we, when we talk about the magnitude of worship, we're talking about its importance. Because you see, the concept of worship, the worship of, concept of the worship of God dominates the Bible from Genesis all the way through Revelation. Every book in the Old Testament and the New Testament alike is filled with concepts, principles, commands, ideas about worship. Uh, in Genesis, we discovered that the fall came when men failed to have God first in their lives. The first murder came about. Cain killed his brother. Why? It all revolved around worship and bad worship. And, and, we, and we skip all the way over to Revelation. Uh, we learn that in Revelation that all history will end in an eternal worshiping community in the presence of a loving, sovereign God. I love the passage. There's so many parts of Revelation we don't understand, right? Uh, but there are some parts that are just beautiful and easy to be understood. And one of them is found in chapter 5, where John is given this, vi this vision of heaven. And listen to the way he describes it in John 5, 13. He says, Then I heard every creature in heaven, notice this, all-inclusive, and on earth, and under the earth, and on the sea, and in all that is in them, doing what? Singing, singing to Him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. You know, folks, let's practice. One day we're going to be in that chorus. And so would you with me, just starting right there where it says, to Him who sits, let's, let's, let's acclaim to God those words of praise together in unison, right? Starting with to Him, okay? To Him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Doesn't that feel good? Fantastic. And one day that will just go on and on and on and we'll be so caught up and involved in that worship of God. And John said, the four living creatures said, Amen, so be it. And the elders fell down and worship. You know, I, I, I thought about this in the early services. I got to this point, and, and I really didn't have it in my notes. But I, I got to thinking about it. You know, in the church that I grew up, and I don't know why this was, that basically when we sang, hardly any of the men sang. The women and children sang. Why that was, I don't know. I remember I used to, to as, a, as a child and a teen, would look around and say, well, why the guy? Now, my dad sang very much off key, but uh, uh, he'll hear this on tape. Sorry, Dad. Uh, 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 but I always appreciated the fact that, that though he wasn't a great singer, my dad, contrary to most all of the other men in the church, sang. And, uh, and, and there may be some of you, I don't know, I, this is a singing congregation, but if you're a person who just singing is not your, you'd say it's not my thing, it, it ought to get to be your thing. <laughs> really. Uh, you, you, you may say, I, I can't carry a tune. That doesn't matter. God's not worried about whether you're on key or not. God's, worried, God, God's not worried, but He's concerned about coming from the heart through the vocal cords up to Him. And, and if you're planning on going to heaven, and I hope every one of you are, then one day you're going to be caught up in this course. And I suspect He'll give all of us great singing voices. <laughs> uh, yeah, let's hope so. Yeah. 
Uh, but if you don't sing, start singing. Because it's so important that we give our praise to our sovereign God. Because it's, it's the dominant theme of the Bible. And going back to the Old Testament, the first of the Ten Commandments calls for worship of God and Him only. In the Old Testament, worship covered all of life. For example, the tabernacle was designed and laid out to emphasize the priority of God's presence and the worship of Him. In fact, let me make an interesting contrast here. In Exodus, the description of the details of the tabernacle, the construction and the erection, the building of the tabernacle, requires seven chapters, seven long chapters in the book of Exodus, a total of 243 verses laid out just for the details of the tabernacle. By contrast, if we go back to Genesis, only 31 verses in Genesis are devoted to the creation of the world. Now, can you imagine? 31 verses, creation of the world. Seven chapters to the construction of the tabernacle that says worship of God is important. Does that say something about the importance that God gave to His people about worship? Let me go even a step further. When the Israelites were traveling, you remember between Egypt and Canaan, and they would stop, they they would take the tabernacle and they'd stop and they'd camp, and God told them how to camp. And And the very arrangement of the camp suggests that worship was central to all other activity because whenever they would camp, the tabernacle was right in the middle of the camp. And then right around the tabernacle were the priests who carried on the worship. And then just outside of the priests were the Levites who who did the service things as far as worship was concerned. And then outside of them was all of the rest of the Israelites, but they were to camp facing the tabernacle. Why? Because it was the place uh, of the presence of God and they were to be worshiping Him. Now, if that's not enough to convince us, Moses' law spelled out exactly how the implements, the tools used in the worship were to be made. Exodus 30, verses 34 through 36, give us, a, for example, a prescription for incense. Now, incense is symbolic of worship in the Bible because its fragrance rises into the air just as true worship rises to God. And verses 37 and 38 of that 30th chapter sound a strong warning about this incense. And we might say, well, that's trivial or picky. No, not really. Listen to what it says. God said... Do not make any incense with this formula for yourselves. Consider it holy to the Lord. And then he says, whoever makes any like like it to enjoy its fragrance must be cut off from his people. God is saying here is a recipe for a special perfume emblematic of worship. And it is to be unique and holy. And if anyone dares to make this perfume for himself just to smell better, I will kill him. That's exactly what that passage is saying. So throughout the New Testament, and that's just, that's just touching the hem of the garment, worship is so important. It is impossible for us to overemphasize the importance of worship. But you may be sitting there thinking, I thought this was a series of sermons on the Sermon on the Mount. It is, so let's go to that. Let's come to the New Testament. In the Sermon on the Mount in particular, the importance of worship is emphasized Throughout just about that entire three chapters, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And as we think about what matters most, Jesus really deals with the the subject of worship in in these three chapters. In fact, the entire sixth chapter deals with several aspects of worship. Let's just take a quick bird's eye view of that sixth chapter. And, And as we look at this, we'll see several things that we want to steer away from that Jesus talks about in in this passage. For example, A on your outline is bad motivation. We want to stay away from bad motivation when it comes to worship. In other words, in in that chapter, he talks about three subjects, uh, more than three, but three in particular. He talks about giving, how we give. He talks about praying, how we pray. He talks about fasting. And in all three of those areas, if we had time to read the complete scripture, he rebukes those who do those things with the hopes of getting praised by other people. Do you, do you see that? He says, in other words, when you pray in public, don't worry what, what, about what other people are thinking. Uh, when you fast, don't go around telling everybody you're fasting so that people say, ooh, look how whole he is. You know, my, there's a dedicated person, been fasting for two days, been fasting for a week, been fasting for two weeks. 
Jesus said, that's between you and God. When you give, don't let other people know what you're giving so that they'll praise you. It's between you and God. And in fact, I think this particular passage speaks loudly and clearly to those of us who, by the nature of what we do, happen to be up front. Like me, for example, preaching and and the praise team leading us uh, in worship. I think what this passage is saying is, uh, for those of us who happen to be up front, examine your motives. Why do you do what you do? Is it to, to be praised by other people? And, and folks, this is not a, uh, going against the idea of encourage, when somebody sings a solo and it, if it blesses your heart. That's good to go to a person and say, thank you for, for blessing me with that. Uh, that. That's good. That's not what we're talking about here. But, but it, it's saying for us who are up front, examine why we're doing this. It re- sort of reminds me of a cartoon that I saw one time. It, it, it showed a, a soloist holding the microphone. I think it was a lady who was getting ready to sing, and she was speaking to the congregation before the music started, and she said, uh, this song is not particularly meaningful, but does provide a great showcase for my voice. <laughs> uh, that, that's comical, but it carries a great message, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so Jesus warns us against bad motivation. He says, if, if, you're doing it, if you're doing what you're doing just to be seen and praised by men, then you've got your praise and don't expect any from me. And so let's make sure that our worship is never hindered by bad motivation. But then also in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talks about bad relationships, bad relationships and how they affect our worship. To put it simply, let me just summarize this point, although I'm going to talk more about it. But to summarize it, he's saying bad relationships kill effective worship. Did you get that? If you just remember that sentence. Bad relationships kill effective worship. Now here's how Jesus said it in Matthew 5, 23 and 24. He said, therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave uh, your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Do you see the importance of that? You know, now logic would say, we'd probably say, you know, he's got a good point there. And uh, so if you're here maybe communing or getting ready to put your gift in the offering plate and you remember there's a, there's a barrier between me and somebody else and I need to take care of that, uh, we'd say, go ahead and put your offering in or go ahead and take communion and this afternoon take care of that. Jesus said, no, 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 no. He said, stop right where you are. Don't put your money in the offering plate. Don't commune. Get up right where you are, right in the middle of the service. I won't ask where you're going. <laughs> yeah? But you're headed out to, to the telephone to call somebody and say, I, I did such and such and I need for you to forgive me. Or uh, I know this, this is an issue that's been going on between us and I, just, I need to get it right. And as soon as you get it right, then come back and continue. Do you see that? And what Jesus is saying, he said, that's how important having good relationships is to effective worship. And the Bible teaches us over and over the importance of good relationships. In fact, Paul says, be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love, and make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. But we all know that relationships encounter difficulties, don't they? As long as we're people I'm people and you're people. You know, there are times that uh, we rub each other wrong. There are times we irritate each other. There are times that that problems uh, uh, rise up. And Jesus is saying that in order for us to worship God acceptably, acceptably, we have to put forth the initiative to maintain loving and forgiving relationships. Now, it's interesting when we really look at this closely. Matthew 5 in the Sermon on the Mount says that if you realize that your friend has something against you, you go to him. In Matthew 18, it says that if you realize you have something against your friend, you go to him. Wait a minute, did I read that right? If your friend has something against you, you go to him. And if you have something against your friend, you go to him. Yeah, I read that right. Now, what's our natural instinct? In other words, that has you going to him in both cases. 
My natural instinct is to say, mm, that's not fair. <laughs> I mean, if he initiated the problem, he ought to come to me, is what my logic says, but that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said it doesn't make a difference who initiated the problem. You or him. You go to him. You take the initiative. And we, we tend to say, that's not fair. That doesn't work like that. But you see, the truth of the matter is that God is not asking us to do anything he hasn't already done. And we need to realize that. You see, God didn't initiate the barrier that existed between us and him. We did when we sinned. We should have been the ones running to God. When Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, instead of hiding behind the bushes, they should have been running through the garden saying, God, God, where are you? We've sinned. But God came looking for them. And so has he always done that. God has always been the initiator in the God-person relationship. He sent his son to die on the cross for us while we were still sinning against him. So you want to worship God acceptably? Then be willing to be the one to give up rights, to lay self aside, and to focus upon the other person's needs in the relationship. And friends, listen, only then, only then can you sing praises to God and your songs reach heaven. Only then can you pray and have your prayers heard. Only then can you give and have God pleased with your gift. It's a big challenge, admittedly, but it's the truth of God's Word. Jesus says, steer away from bad motivation, steer away from bad relationships. And then he says, steer away from bad lifestyles. He deals with bad lifestyles. Now, before we look at what Jesus said in this regard, let me take a quick look back at the Old Testament again. I want us to look at a sort of a long passage from the first chapter of Isaiah. And I want to give you the paraphrased version from the message of that passage. But let me give you the context first. The context is that because of their godlessness, because of their sinfulness, their godless lifestyles, God compares the Israelites in Isaiah's day to the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Enough said? We know about that. Then God rebukes them in that in spite of their godless lifestyles, they were continuing to carry on every Sabbath, every week, the worship that was laid out for them, pretending that they were living godly lives. And God is not fooled. God is not mocked. And listen to what he says to the Israelites. And again, this is a paraphrase. But he says, quit your worship charades. He said, I can't stand your trivial religious games, monthly conferences, weekly Sabbath, special meetings, 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 meetings. I can't stand one more, God says. Meetings for this, meetings for that. I hate them. You've worn me out. God says, I'm sick of your religion, 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 while you go right on sinning. When you put on your next prayer performance, I'll be looking the other way. When you, uh, no matter how long or loud or often you pray, God says, I'll not be listening. And you know why? Because you've been tearing people to pieces and your hands are bloody. Go home and wash up, clean up your act, sweep your lives clean of your evil doing so I don't have to look at them any longer. Say no to wrong, learn to do good, work for justice, help the down and out, stand up for the homeless, go to bat for the defenseless. But folks, that's pretty strong language, isn't it? But the people mistakenly thought that they were going on about their regular sacrifices and worship and that God was not paying any attention to the huge gaps the huge inconsistencies in their daily living. But friends, I want to tell you, they were dead wrong. And if we think along those same lines, we're as wrong as they were. Because God is paying attention. God's paying attention to what we're doing right here, right now, this Sunday morning at 11.59. We're going to go past noon today, by the way. <laughs> God's paying strict attention to what's going on now. But you know what? He's going to be paying strict attention to what you're doing tomorrow at noon. And Tuesday at 5 p.m. and Wednesday at 11 p.m. God's going to be look, looking and paying attention. Jesus points out in the Sermon on the Mount that we can make the same horrible mistake that the Israelites made. For example, you can come to the assembly of God's people like this here every Sunday and you can sing and pray and commune and listen to the message. But if you're not careful in the use of your money, Jesus points out in the Sermon on the Mount, you could be on a regular basis laying up for yourself treasures on earth. That's in Matthew 6, 19. By being stingy and selfish and failing week after week to bring your first fruits to God. 
You, you could be an every Sunday attendee here at Avalon and not realize that God is looking into your heart Monday through Saturday. What does he see? Worry. W-O-R-R-Y. You worry about this and you worry about that. You fret and you fume over this situation and that situation and how this bill is going to get paid and what my child is doing and what my spouse is doing. You just worry. And in Matthew 6, 25 through 34, Jesus tells us to sum it up, to sin, to worry. To sin, to worry. But he says we're to place our entire trust in God, the one who created us and cares for us more than we could ever realize, the one who desperately desires to be our shepherd and allow him to meet our every need. And folks, in light of that passage that we don't have time to read there in Matthew 6, 25, following about worrying, we ought to get up every day, read that passage, and then say out loud to God, something like this. We ought to say, Dear holy and victorious God, You alone are worthy of all my worship, my heart's devotion, all my praise, and all my trust, and all the glory of my life. And God, I worship You. I bow to You today, and I give myself over to You again today, and I surrender every aspect of my life totally and completely to You because I know that you said, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. And here I am with all my burdens today, God, all my cares. And God, I just want you to know that I trust in you. And I commit to you my life and my spouse and my children and my grandchildren. I commit them to your care this day because I know you love me and you're going to look after me. Can you imagine... If we were to pray like that every day and then follow through with our lives, our actions and our thoughts, if, if we were to do that every day, Monday through Saturday, we could come into this place every Sunday and know that when we stand here and sing and commune, God is looking with great pleasure and saying, those are my people. I love them so much. And that worship is coming up as a sweet incense before he's thrown. Or you could be a person who never misses partaking of the Lord's Supper. If you miss on Sunday morning, you make sure you get it Sunday night. Or maybe get it brought to your home. And that's great. But folks, you could do that and it might not mean a thing if you have a heart that's inclined to judge other people harshly. You see, Jesus dealt with that in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own? And then he, he says, you hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. You see what he's saying? He's saying you can commune all you want to, you can sing all you want to, but if you've got a, a, a tongue that's always criticizing and judging other people and jumping to conclusions about other people's lives and saying, I wouldn't do that. You know, I wouldn't live that way. And making harsh judgments. He's saying, your worship is cut off. Have you ever wondered why Jesus spoke so strongly about things like that? I think it's because he knows things we don't know. I read about a, a, a letter to, the, to Ann Landers, a grocery store checkout clerk, wrote to Ann Landers, and, and it was a harsh letter in which she complained that in her job she so frequently saw people buy what she called luxury food items like birthday cakes and bags of shrimp with their food stamps. And this checkout uh, clerk in her letter went on to say that she thought all, the, all those people were lazy and wasteful. And a few weeks went by and all of a sudden Ann Landers' column was filled with replies from people who were writing in response to that letter. And I, don't have, I wish I could share more of them, but I'm going to just share one of them. One wrote, I'm the woman who bought the $17 cake and paid for it with food stamps. I thought the checkout woman would burn a hole through me with her eyes. What she didn't know is the cake was for my little girl's birthday. It will be her last. She has bone cancer and will probably be gone within six to eight months. Oh, how'd you like to have been the clerk who wrote that letter? Now Jesus' words make sense, don't they? When he says, get the beam out of your own eye. 
Now, if, if I'm speaking to some of us that regularly get our exercise by jumping to wrong conclusions, let's be reminded that that exercise may well be standing between us and acceptable worship of God. Jesus says, get rid of bad lifestyles. And then he deals with one more thing. He deals with bad doctrine. Bad doctrine. In verse 15 of Matthew 7, Jesus says, watch out for false prophets. That's very clear, isn't it? Watch out for false prophets. What does that mean? He, he's saying that there are people who are teaching things that are untrue. And, and, and he's saying to us, don't be gullible spiritually. Don't believe everything you hear. If you just, just because you turn on the TV and there's a preacher who says he's a Christian preacher, that doesn't necessarily mean he's a Christian preacher. That doesn't necessarily mean that everything he's going to say in the next 30 minutes is going to be straight out of the Word of God. He says, don't be gullible. In verses 21 through 23 of that seventh chapter, Jesus tells us that there are going to be a lot of surprises on the day of judgment. People who thought they were going to heaven, but who are going to be turned away with the words, I never knew you. Now, you know, our, at first impulse, we think, oh, yeah, yeah, the atheists, the unbelievers, the non-Christians, certainly they'll be turned away. That's not who he's talking about. Not dealing with them at all in this passage. He's dealing with people who profess to be doing things in his name. He says there are going to be people who are going to say, but didn't we preach in your name? And didn't we even do miracles in your name? And Jesus is going to say, I never knew you. You're not a part of me. Do you know the biggest fear that I have as a preacher? It's a no-brainer. Far and away, the biggest fear, and it's not the only fear I have, but it's the biggest fear I have as a preacher. The biggest fear I have as a preacher is that I fail to tell, the people, fail to tell people the truth about how to get to heaven. I pray frequently, oh God, please, please help me to be on track when I tell people how to become a Christian. Don't let me ever steer somebody astray. That's why many years ago I memorized Acts 2.38. That's why if you've been at Avalon long, you've heard me quote Acts 2.38 hundreds of times. And if you stay at Avalon, you'll hear it hundreds more times. <laughs> you say, why Acts 2.38? And if you don't believe what I'm getting ready to say, I hope you'll come and talk to me later. Because you see, in Acts chapter 2, the Lord's church began. And God, in preparation for that, sent His Holy Spirit from heaven and totally engulfed the apostles, Peter and James and John. Why did He do that? So that He would make sure that Peter and the others would, tell, would say exactly what He wanted them to say on that day. That they wouldn't rely upon frail and faulty human memory. And, and that they wouldn't be grasping for answers when people asked them questions. And so here are Peter and James and John and the other apostles who have been directly guided and inspired by God's Holy Spirit. And so when they preach, and, and if, you, if you know Acts chapter 2, you know that they came to a place where the people started shouting out, Men and brethren, what must we do? And they were asking the, the question, How can we obtain forgiveness? Because Peter had just say, gotten through saying, You killed Jesus. But God raised him up and made him both Lord and Christ and they're pricked in their heart. Their conscience is stricken and they're saying, we want, to, we want to get forgiveness. We want our guilt to be removed. What can we do? And, and you don't read in that place that Peter or any other apostles replied, just pray and invite Jesus into your heart. Folks, that's not there. It's not there. And you don't read that, that they said, believe and repent and you will be saved from this very moment. Folks, those words aren't there. They are absolutely not there. And they didn't say salvation is by grace alone and there's nothing that you need to do but open up your heart. And you've heard that, but it's not there. You didn't hear it out of Acts chapter 2. In fact, you didn't hear it out of the Bible. In preparation for this sermon, I got on the website to some of the biggest churches in this country and folks, those words that I just shared with you are some of the directions that are given on those websites for salvation. But folks, that's not what Peter said. It's not what he said. What did he say? Is, is it up there? Put the, the next one. The next one. Anybody back there? Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, go back to that one. Back up. Okay, those were the things that I said, they aren't in the Bible. But those are the things that we hear people say today. Now go to the next one. Okay. 
Now, you've heard me say it many, many times. I want you to say it with me, okay? Uh, pretend that somebody has come to you and has said, John, Sue, Sally, Bill, would you tell me what I need to do to become a Christian? Could we say that together in, in unison, together now? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Every one of if you did that, every one of us just lined ourselves up beside the Apostle Peter. And, and as I said a little while ago, one of my biggest fears as a preacher is that, I, is that I tell people wrong. But I came to the conclusion years ago, years ago, that if I always give that answer, and if on the day of judgment I'm in hot water, Standing in that hot water, waist high, right beside me is going to be Apostle Peter. Isn't that right? He's going to be right there. Now you are too. <laughs> yeah. But that's Bible, friends. That's Bible. And Jesus says, beware of false prophets. And he says, don't let bad doctrine, don't let bad teaching stand between you and effective worship of God. In other words, believe the word. We looked at that passage where he said, where he talked about the man who built his house on the solid rock and the man who built his house on the sand. The man who built his house on the solid rock, was, who was he? He was the person who heard the words of Jesus and put into action, obeyed the words of Jesus. And in Acts chapter 2, it tells us that 3,000 people were baptized on that same day. Folks, I want to tell you, as long as you have this guy preaching here at Avalon, that's the message of salvation that's going to be preached from this pulpit. Amen. Thank you. Friends, it's our choice. We can line up with those who want to give those other answers, or we can line up with the Holy Spirit and with the apostles and with Jesus. And today we're going to ask the praise team to come in preparation for singing our closing chorus and um, as we see, most of you have been baptized. Uh, and, and I would just really encourage you to stop and think about this whole message today and, and the magnitude of worship and how it impacts. It's not just a 30-minute thing. It's not just an hour-long thing done once a week in a church building. Worship is what you do every day. Worship's how you walk. Worship's how you talk. Worship's how you think. Worship is what has worth in your life. And so let's all renew our commitment to God. God, you're first. You have the most worth in my life. And wherever I am and whatever I'm doing, you're first. But if there are any, there, any here today who've never been immersed into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, as Peter said and we said in Acts 2.38, uh, we're ready to help you and assist you in that today. Will you come as we stand, as we sing together? Mm-hmm.